world work will open you to that realization. And only world work. When you work on individuals, persons, yourself, you don't open to this because you're always limiting and finitizing. That's how valuable world work is. It opens you to the place where you finally can see when they invaded that in that country, someone stands in world work and someone in that country reaching out for God finds help unexpected. Our function is to be that consciousness which is available for someone to reach out and touch. Where I am, God is. That is the truth of all of us now. But keep this truth as a pearl of great price within you. Greetings from Kwame Point Park, and welcome to Stare Up Your Purpose channel. I believe all is well with you. I love this park, though not sure if my pronunciation is correct. It's a nice spot for an evening stroll and a great place to catch those beautiful sunsets. And you can get to see bald eagles. Today, I'm sharing the last class from the Realization of Oneness seminar given by Ab Fitch in 1972, titled No World Out There. This talk I'm sharing is just 90 minutes from the over 110 hour seminar. And I believe I've shared probably about 11 hours of this illuminating seminar. If you want to dig deeper into the talks, you can download the transcripts of the whole seminar in the link below. Today's talk centers around doing world work. This goes beyond the truth that if we have reached a certain level of understanding of truth, we might get to a level where we are able to avoid the disasters of the world. But as Joel said, that's not enough. There's no problem avoiding the disasters of a world. If you are in truth, it shall not come nigh thee. But now he says, you haven't been learning just so you can avoid the disasters of this world. Now you must become a center of light unto the world, a place where truth is demonstrated, not as an individual alone, but as a universal truth. I've listened to this talk more than three times, and it, it resonates deeply with me. The truth is, some of us are already doing world work, as in W-O-R-K. But we might not be aware that is what we are doing. And this type of talk serves to remind us what we already know, and also gives us more clarity so that we can come up higher and do it on a conscious and deliberate basis. For me, it reminds me of a time I was contemplating the damage done by transatlantic slavery. Though slavery has been abolished a long time ago, the psychological fallout and trauma is still with us today. And I came to realize this probably a couple of years after immigrating to Canada. And it was in that moment of contemplation, thinking about what can I do in my own little way that the awareness on what to do surfaced. And as I listen to Harp's talk, I can see that the insight I receive on what to do can be termed as world work. You can check my video titled, Don't Call Me Black, part one and part two, to get some context of what I'm talking about. I will be doing a part three of this very soon. World work is not about changing or fixing anything on the outside. It is recognizing that there is no world out there. And as Joel said, in the midst of threatening world conditions, I say to you, think in higher terms than your own health, your own supply, or your own happiness. 
For some part of every day, give yourself to the realization and the practice of these principles through which you have witnessed healings of minor or major problems. Principles that have helped you or your neighbor. Begin now to think in terms of a principle revealing itself on earth as a presence of God universally. Let me also share with you someone in the great book of life, the Bible, Elisha, who understood world work, standing and living consciously in the finished kingdom of God. He declared, hear the word of the Lord. First says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of finely milled flour will sell for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. <laughs> This was at a time when famine was so severe that the inhabitants were purchasing products that were barely edible as well as being ceremonially unclean. Now, it declares tomorrow what was sold for about a thousand dollars we sell for one dollar. Then there was this intellectual guy referred to as a royal officer on whose arm the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, if the Lord should make windows in heaven for the rain, could this thing take place? Elisha did not argue with this guy, full of ego, but said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but because you doubt, you will not eat of it. Elisha was not concerned about world projections, but stood in his I amness and made a declaration and truth went forth to reveal itself and when truth goes to reveal itself the world might appear to be convulsed the story went on with the information that four men who were lepers were at the entrance of a city's gate and they said to one another why should we sit here until we die if we say we will enter the city then the famine is in the city and we will die there. And if we sit still here, we would also die. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans, Syrians. If they let us live, we will live. And if they kill us, we will only die. The summary of his story was, as they moved to the camp, the Lord caused the Aramean army to hear the sound of chariots and the sound of horses, the sound of a great army. They thought that the king of Israel had, had hired a great army and they fled and the lepers met an empty camp full of food and drinks and they ate and drank. But they later felt ashamed and said they had to inform the king's household of this great news. And from there the king appointed the royal officer to be in charge of the city gate. That was that uh, intellectual guy who had questioned Elisha. Thereafter, the starving people trampled him at the gate as they struggled to get through for food, and he died. And food became very, very cheap, just as Elisha had declared. You can check this story in 2 Kings chapter 7. I will recommend reading this chapter and contemplate the story. Now, just to be clear, World work is not about how things transpire or how through truth will reveal itself. It is just standing in, the, in truth and allowing truth to reveal itself the way it chooses. Now, if this is your first encounter with the infinite way of teaching, I will say congratulations. For you have on your lap the principles that can unlock the hidden treasures of life without struggle. You only need to stand firm and put the principles to test and practice in any area of life such as health, time and money, freedom, relationships, and even world work. And as you abide in this truth, your true essence of being will shine forth and reveal that which you are contemplating. Enjoy the talk and also enjoy the beautiful scenery from Kwame's Park. 
Thanks. Bye. Welcome again. It would be a perfect meeting today if we were all at a certain place in the Bible, which is signified here by the 12th verse in the 21st chapter of John. Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And then he breaketh, taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. Now there are other translations of come and dine which are more accurate. The world today as then has been in a form of fasting from truth. Just as we are to fast from untruth, we have been fasting from reality. And when the Master says, come and dine, he's really saying to his disciples, break your fast. He isn't saying, come and dine, he's saying, let us have breakfast. Let us break our fast now from the unreality. Let us sup now on that which is real. And so he takes fish and bread to them. This breaking of the fast is where we should be. In our consciousness, we should be breaking the fast from mortality, from materiality, from that which is not of the Father. We should be ready to dine. And this is now exemplified further in the 18th and 19th verses. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Thus spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. You'll find that later in Peter, the second epistle, the first chapter in the 14th verse, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Peter acknowledges that he must put off this tabernacle as Christ showed him. Now, old and young here refer to spirit, when you are spiritually young and spiritually mature. And when we were young, we girded ourselves and walked where we wished. We were in human will. But as we become spiritually mature, we are girded by another. In short, the Christ takes over and we walk in divine will. And this is where the disciples are as the gospel ends. Walking in divine will, the new man released, the old self impersonalized. And today, when we take up world work, we'll find a few secrets about it. We have been in the process of learning truth. And as Joel points out as he begins the chapter 12 in Realization of Oneness, there is now a point where many are able to avoid the disasters of the world. He says that's not enough. There's no problem avoiding the disasters of the world. If you're in truth, it shall not come nigh thee. But now he says you haven't been learning just so you could avoid the disasters of this world. Now you must become a center of light unto the world. A place where truth is demonstrated not as an individual alone, 
but as a universal truth. And so when he bids us take up world work, the first thought we have is, oh, we're going to now help the world. And we must learn we're not going to help the world at all. World work is quite different than helping the world. The secret behind world work is twofold. One is that you are learning that the world is the veil where yourself is. Your world work is to unveil your own self. We have been thinking in terms of our human selfhood and even when we accept spirituality we still think in terms of a limited personal spiritual selfhood and there is none. World work is the expression of your infinity as being. When you rest in the word and know the truth of the world you are merely finding yourself as an infinite being. And therefore, in every book, when Joel speaks of world work, the real secret is his revelation there to those of us have eyes that we are not to live within the boundaries of a mortal concept. When you are able to through the knowledge of the one self reveal the non-existence of material powers on the earth you are really finding the one God you are believing in God to believe in God takes a new turn now you cannot believe in God only where you are or around the corner you must believe in only God. There can be no second belief. Our world work is the expression of our belief in God as the universal self. And there is a further development as we deepen and make a greater penetration into reality. Now then, we have been ordained. We have been chosen. We have been chosen through scripture, although we had not realized that we were chosen. We have been chosen to walk a separate path than the world. We have been chosen to bear witness to the activity of God in human consciousness. And if you do not accept the fact that God has chosen you to function as a light upon the earth, then this is not believing in God. Because the words of Scripture are very clear that you may not hide your light under a bushel. That you are here to be a faithful witness. That you are here to be a transparency. That you are here to Christ the world not to love it or hate it or fear it, but to Christ it. You are here to bless the world. And as you survey the activity of Christ on earth, appearing as Jesus, you will see that by words and by deeds, everything that was done was to make you aware that this is the Christ of your own being appearing in what we call mortal flesh. The words of the Christ were the words of yourself. The deeds of the Christ were the deeds of yourself. And they were words and deeds to show you the nature of your own being. We must now look at Jesus Christ in another way, as the outer expression of your own self. And the ordainment comes from that Christ of your own self saying, now, believe on me. Follow me. Deny your own mortality. Pick up your cross of mortality. 
Do not hide your light, but walk in the footsteps of the visible Christ. This is the ordainment, and it must take us out of the desire to improve our personal condition. That is the very purpose of world work. It is not to improve the world. It is to lift you out of the belief that you are a finite being and that where the world seems to be, you are. Now, when you practice world work, it may seem to you that you're doing a favor to someone somewhere that you're helping them behind the Iron Curtain, or you're helping them in the White House, or you're helping someone somewhere, but you're not. Until you are willing to step outside of the mortal boundaries of the mind and without desire for personal reward, do world work, you are not accepting the infinity of your own being. It is a subtle way in which Joel has lifted us up to look face to face at our own infinity and either reject it or accept it. Now, while you are doing world work, you may not seem to be meeting your own personal problems, and yet that is the way to meet them. The world work you do will take you out of the false sense of self which has the sense of personal problems. And so Joel is stressing again and again in more ways than meets the eye that you must be taken out of your own sense of self. You must learn to give of yourself to something bigger than a person, to something bigger than helping persons anywhere. giving the universe back to God. <coughs> now, in our world work, then, we're going to find that we're not thinking of ourselves. We're not thinking of my lot in life. We're not thinking of my physical condition. We're not thinking of our finances. We're not thinking of anything that will make us enjoy life more. And if you've been touched by the vision of truth, you know that is the way in which all of the doors of the inner mansions open. As long as there's a remnant of personal self left in us, which is still saying, what about me? We have lost the way and we are separated. Among the last words of the Master within were, Feed my sheep. But who are my sheep when all is one Christ? Do you see how that has been hidden from the world? We could open kitchens for the poor. That wouldn't feed the sheep. You would still leave them in dying bodies. Always the desire to help and to overhelp and to be a crusader has hidden the fact that feeding my sheep means to recognize the universal Christ. Now as you sit back and think of the many teeming ideas that come to you all day about how you should improve yourself, remember you are living in a limited sense of self when you do that. The great vision of unselfing was brought to mankind by the crucifixion. When Joel says impersonalize and Christ Jesus walks forth and shows crucifixion, you are hearing the same word to impersonalize and to crucify are identical. Every time you impersonalize you are crucifying a false concept. One word is more harsh 
but it is also more total. It is the word we have to face. In order to be free, you must live in truth. And you cannot live in truth as long as you believe that God created human flesh. Now then, if we're going to do world work, we're not going to improve human flesh. As Joel puts it, we're not going to go behind the Iron Curtain surreptitiously because Christ is already there. Now, are you ready to make a turn that will be very significant? If you are accepting truth, if you are willing to agree that because God did not create human flesh, that flesh is not here. That whatever God did not create is not here. That something else must be here, and it is the universal spirit. Your world work is to rest in the conscious knowledge that universal spirit everywhere is the only presence and is unopposed. There's nothing for you to do beyond the recognition, the acknowledgement of the universal Christ. That will encompass loving God supremely. It will encompass loving your neighbor. It will include everything that is taught as a principle. the recognition that only universal spirit is present. Now in universal spirit there can be no sickness or war, no death or disease, no lack, no limitation. And therefore we're not trying to remove these things, we're recognizing their non-existence. We are maintaining a transparent divine consciousness which is unconditioned, which knows no mortal powers, no material powers, no human powers. It does not acknowledge evil, and therefore it does not seek to remove evil. It does not resist evil. It does not try to dissolve evil. We recognize only invisible spirit in which evil has no existence. And knowing this truth, you rest in this truth. And that spirit which you recognize to be universal is the spirit of your being. Now, if these facts are clear, then we must find where is this human flesh? Where are these world conditions? Where are the evils? Where are the problems? Where are the limitations? Where are the errors? The martyrdom of Peter was that he was going to die to the flesh to be born of the Spirit. The Father has no pleasure in our dying. Our death is the glorification of our spirit. Our death is the death of all material concepts. In the death of material concept, we are obeying the scripture which says, The Father takes no pleasure in your dying, wherefore turn ye and live. 
Now the turn is, and this comes fittingly at the end of our long journey, opening a new door, the turn for us must be that the world out there is not there. And there is a practice for you which must be begun in earnest. If you have glimpsed it from time to time or practiced it from time to time, now is the time to accelerate. Turn ye. There is no event in this world that is out there. And there are no exceptions. Whatever you see out there is within your mortal mind. And we want to learn how to place it correctly within our mortal mind and then dismiss it. It may be an army, but it isn't out there. It may be an epidemic, but it isn't out there. It may be an ocean, but it isn't out there. There is nothing out there but God. And all that you believe to be out there with the mortal mind exists only within the mortal mind. And you can tuck it safely into that mortal mind and forget it. Now at our pinnacle of this work, we must take the events of the world and locate them within ourselves, never outside. And so I mean that wherever you look, whoever you see is within you. There is no outside. There was no outside to Christ. There is no outside to you, for the Spirit of God has no outside. Now, the in-self of you is the everywhere. The self of you, then, which is here, is also there and everywhere, and there is no outside to everywhere. The moment you have something happening outside yourself, you are not believing in God. You are not believing in yourself. You are not believing yourself to be spirit. Spirit has no outside. Now perhaps you own some property. It is within your mortal mind. Perhaps you own an automobile or a home or some land or a business. They are all within your mortal mind. Perhaps you have children or parents. They are within your mortal mind. Perhaps you have a physical body. It is within your mortal mind. Everything in the world is within your mortal mind. And there must be a conscious knowing of this from time to time to time. Daily. There must be periods of knowing that which I see out there, whatever its name or nature, is within my mortal mind. The entire world is within my mortal mind. And to consciously take events, incidents, things, people, forms, conditions, objects, and to quietly know that which I see out there is within me. It has no power other than the power I have given it. When I know it is within me and rest with that knowledge within me until a realization of that truth comes that there is no outside, everything is within me, then that which is outside visibly loses its power. That was the secret of Hezekiah. They have only the arm of flesh, meaning they are nothing but my own mortal thought. All form, all person, 
all event, all condition. And as you dwell with this, contemplating it, <coughs> swiftly acknowledging it to be not an external something but an inner idea or thought, and resting with it for a moment to wash it with silence, you will discover that there is really no world outside. And you are turning. You are opening the way for a new life. You are learning what Peter learned that day from the Master. Here is bread and here is fish. Come and dine. Break your mortal fast. Dine on the truth of being. To live mystically is to recognize the world has no existence except in human thought. The acknowledgement of this must be followed with the abiding in it consciously daily. There must be periods of abiding in this truth before you have the true inner experience that the world in the outer has always been a concept maintained only by world mind in every individual being. That is why there are no powers. That is why there is no disease. That is why there is no death. But this means nothing unless you learn to live with this awareness. And when you do, you find that you don't have employees or employers. You don't have students or teachers. This is all external, and there is no external. Bring it back into the within of your mind Recognize it to be your conscious awareness of an outer which only exists in your conscious awareness. And then you have located the trap of mortal mind. And rest in the word. God is not flesh and God is all. Where is the flesh? God is not a blade of grass and God is all. Where is the blade of grass? God is not an ocean. Where is the ocean? God is none of this world. Where is this world? It simply never was there. Yourself is there. And until you are willing and ready and able to tuck the world within your mortal mind and rest there, until you know that's where it always has been, it never could get out of there. When you have done this many times, it will dawn upon you that Christ Jesus lived in heaven where men saw earth. And that all of the miracles were the revelation that what we thought was outside never was there. Our concept was changed by the Christ and we saw a different outside and called it an improvement. We were still looking at the good instead of the bad. And Joel has taken us to see that neither the good is there nor the bad. And so now living mystically you have this way of life. First, you must know the unreality of all evil. It isn't out there. If it were, then God wouldn't be there. Step number one, the unreality of evil. 
which must be followed by the unreality of good. When you have neither evil out there nor good out there, you are believing in the omnipresence of God's spirit. And then you rest in the word. And the truth you know that neither good is out there nor evil is out there quickly or eventually sets you free. For if you know the truth that there is no world of good matter or of evil matter, no good conditions and no bad conditions, no good people and no bad people, You are living in the inner spirit, which is the allness. You are accepting that only God is. Now we're closing the gap between God and man. We believe in God, but do we believe in God's self as our self? Are we willing to close the gap into one? Are we willing finally to take the book and accept what it tells us, that God is one, and beside God there is no other, and therefore to exist at all I must be that one? You believe in God, now believe in me, says the Christ. You believe in God, now believe in yourself. And finally, the last form that you impersonalize may be your own. It never was there either. It, too, is a mortal concept. All that you could ever be is the mystical body of Christ. We have tucked the world in where it belongs in the world mind. We have tucked the world mind into our own little mind, knowing that our mind and the world mind are one and the same. And the world now is safely tucked within us. It really has no power when you know that. Pilate, you do not exist out there. You seem to be, but I know you're not out there. You're simply an idea in the world mind. You're an idea in my mind, and that's why thou couldst have no power. If I thought you were a person out there, you'd have lots of power. All disease is seen the same way. It only has power because we think it's out there. Tuck it into your mind. That's the only place it is. And you can say, what did hinder thee? There was nothing out there to hinder you except the Spirit of God. Tuck your business into your mind. Tuck your students into your mind. Tuck your employees into your mind. They're not out there. The only place they exist is within your mind. And rest in the knowledge that all that is out there is yourself. And this is the way you release grace into your life. Once the world is no longer there, <coughs> there's no more duality. There's no more separation. You don't believe in separate lives. You don't believe in people who are growing up and dying someday. You're not malpracticing the world, watching it and believing in mortal bodies. You're accepting the dispensation of the true life. Now, whoever reaches the level then 
where they can accept and realize the non-existence of an external world is one who can answer the call that says, I have chosen thee. That one is prepared by those who have attained and have become invisible already and is lifted up to the point where they enter the realm of soul and can behold the activity of Christ in the consciousness of the world. They become a witness of Christ. And they find that in their new dispensation, their sole function is to leaven the consciousness of the world. by living and abiding and dwelling in the truth of spirit as an omnipresent reality without opposite. Nothing comes nigh their dwelling. Nothing attacks them. They're not limited because they have discovered that all that exists is the one self. They have reached the realization that the one self that exists is their name. And they see this as a universal truth. Wherever you look, you are looking at yourself. And wherever you are not aware that you are looking at yourself, you are in duality. Because there is no other self than your own. In this one undivided consciousness, you find that Christ is truly living itself as the only power. First, the unreality of evil, tuck it within you in the mortal mind and see that that's the only place it is. Or you can give it a hundred reasons why it can't be there because you know God is there. And now tuck the good and see the unreality of that in your mortal mind. And then rest in the knowledge that only spirit is present. There is no outside world. This practice many times a day as you find you can will deepen you unto the knowledge that you have found the river of truth you finally remove the shadow of mortality and then you will be prepared to fulfill your function on this earth our function is manifold. We are here to bear witness of the one light. We are here to be faithful witness to the truth that only God exists. We are here to demonstrate the universal nature of Christ. All of this takes us out of the personal self, the personal ambition, the personal desire, the personal need, the personal want. That was yesterday's mortal mind consciousness for those who have graduated, who have turned and are living mystically. They're moving toward the next world, which is the true universe behind this world, in which we all live not for personal selfhood, but simply to express divinity.
If a person were deeply ambitious, it would now be wise to take a good second look at the complete Gospel of John, privately, by yourself. You will notice how every deed is a revelation of the invisible nature of Christ where the world had seen form in the outer. How every word is a statement by the invisible Christ which the world interpreted to be the words of Jesus. And you will find that every word spoken by Christ is the truth of your being. There is not a single word spoken by Christ that is not true of you because that Christ speaking those words is you. I am the life. Where is the other life? What other life is there if I, Christ, am the life? We lose all belief in separated human lives. We find there is no life on this earth that can die. We find death is the belief in separated lives. There is no life to die. I am the life. All human death was a mortal mind concept, a sense illusion. But so is human life. We must see that there is no reality to the evil and no reality to the good. Always present is the invisible spirit of your own being. Now we share, then, one invisible spiritual being. This is who we are. What's bad for you is bad for me. What's good for you is good for me. Whatever you know is going to have some effect on everyone else. You never seek personal good anymore. There's nothing to seek. I already am that self. You're not concerned about time 2,000 years ago, it never existed. The self that I am now is the self that always was and always will be. You see, this is the consciousness you need to do the world work, and this is the consciousness that is developed as you do the world work. The Christ controls what we have thought of as weather, what we have thought of as conditions, as epidemics, as plagues, <coughs> as floods and fires. And in the knowledge that these are in the external only in mortal mind and nowhere else, we are now in a position to join those who have walked before us and who spiritually and visibly now are doing world work. We can actually be one with our own invisible self, which are termed the invisible spirits of the world. Many of the higher dimension consciousness have come down behind us to help us and fortunately, some in this dimension can rise up to a higher. And we are all joining that one household now. To live not in the world of effects. Our grace is not going to come by prayer to God in the sky. That outmoded method of life is over for us. And as we develop now, accepting my spirit is omnipresent, my spirit is omnipresent and omniscient, my spirit is the only power, we countenance no opposite. We know that every opposite to my perfect power, my perfect presence, my perfect knowing 
is a false concept in a human mind. Never getting outside that mind, even though it appears out there. You might see it this way. On the screen of a movie, you're looking at how the West was won. And half hour later, there's another movie there, all about the Godfather. But they're both appearing on the same screen. Where are they actually happening in that little millimeter film, which contains everything that goes on the screen? And no matter how the scene shifts on the screen, you may see 50 different scenes on the screen. It's all in that little millimeter of the film. So it is that no matter what you see out there in this world, it's all within the mortal mind. That's the only place it is. The rest is consciousness objectified. Always bring it back into the little film. That's the only place it is. It has no power there when you recognize that's where it's located. And as Joel said, if it's an atom bomb, what difference? If you get it back into the film, if you get it back into the world mind, into the individual human mind, and see, that's the only place it is. It never is out there. There is no out there. Only God is out there. And I'll close the gap and see God out there and God where I am are one and the same. All that's out there is my spirit. Don't make God a separate self. There is no second to God. There's only God life. Now you're qualified as you develop this capacity to do world work. You're ready to be a light. You can be a transparency for the truth. And it makes no difference what world conditions come into view. One with spirit is a majority. And so we have been trained to bless the world by knowing its non-existence, by releasing man from the belief that he is a creature who walks under two powers, under material law, under world karma. We're saying, get thee behind me, Satan. You only exist the only devil there is, is material sense. And because material sense paints a picture of an objectified world out there, when I lose material sense, that world is dissolved. It may continue to appear, but it will slowly undergo a transformation as my consciousness rises. Yes, you can escape the disasters of the world individually. But now you're putting that knowledge into practice to lift the world above the disasters. Now, the way we can practice world work is to consider that the world is our patient. Up to now, individually we've been treating one person here and one person there to learn that your real patient is the world. And just as you may have witnessed some success with one here and one there, now we must witness success by accepting the world as not the creation of God and therefore only an inner idea. We can rest. That is all inclusive. We don't have to pinpoint.
we might take and add a situation which seems to have occurred right out there, right outside, right now. And see the nothingness of all that appears external. The presence of God is all we acknowledge. Here, there, is the one spirit. Now try to know that there is no out there. And then be still there. Now, over the next few months, we're going to set up a program <coughs> so that instantly we can recognize conditions that appear in the world and come into a realization of their non-reality as external events. Oh, you can think of many kinds of such conditions. And wherever you are, it will be your function to live in the truth of your own being, knowing that yourself is where the forest fire seems to be. 
Yourself is where the hurricane seems to be. Yourself is where poverty seems to be. They won't be starving children in India to you. They'll be your invisible self, one invisible self, where many starving children seem to be. And don't look for the children to stop starving because you did that. This is your way of acknowledging one self. This is your way of acknowledging God supremely. We won't turn back and say, now, is it better? We won't get out a yardstick and measure the wound. But you'll discover as you proceed in this method that grace begins to envelop your own life in a new way. Because the bread you cast out through your recognition of one invisible self without an external world comes back and expresses as the one self and its divine qualities in that which appears as the world, in the world, as yourself. You'll find many people are healed that you don't know about. But someone, somewhere, through your work, reaching out for truth, is touched and lifted. And that is why this is a selfless work. You're not trying to help a specific person ever. You're trying to live in truth. It's a broader vision which Joel brought us that as we live in truth, it makes us free. Let's take a brief intermission and then let's explore the chapter very carefully. Today, everyone embarked on a spiritual way of life should have a concern far greater than the demonstration of his own daily harmony. And that concern should be for the survival of the entire world. The question now is, is there a principle of life, a spiritual principle that will govern the world is there a principle which can now be realized and relied upon to prevent the destruction of civilization and the extermination of mankind? That raises many important questions. At this particular level of the message, in that particular year, we were using words like the extermination of civilization and the extermination of mankind. <coughs> Even the Christ in the Bible speaks of the end of the world. But when you have located the world in your mind, it is the end of the world. When you have located civilization in your mind, that is the extermination of civilization for you. We want to see that Joel is speaking not at the absolute level at this point in this book. That came later. But through the preparation at this level, it was possible to then come to the mind of man at the absolute level with a teaching of incorporeality which followed the year later. We who have had the advantage of seeing the later book can accept that this would not be the language for you at this particular moment. You should be past the point of believing that civilization can be exterminated or that the world can be obliterated. Just as God has no pleasure in your dying and only the death of mortality in your consciousness is the acceptable death of the God, so 
only the death of the world in your consciousness is acceptable. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Now the Comforter is finally revealed to us as the realization of your Christ self. When you have accepted your Christ self as the only self in the universe, the Comforter has come unto you. What else made you accept the Christ self but the Comforter? But if I go not away, you cannot reach that realization. And now I is revealed not to be Jesus, but the world mind. The world's sense of self must go away. You must rise above the world's sense of self, just as I is Christ, and then the little I is Jesus. This little I that must go away is the mortal selfhood of the world. When Jesus appears saying, if I go not away, this is the statement that mortal selfhood universally must be obliterated in consciousness. That is the I going away. When you obliterate mortal selfhood as a universal fact in your consciousness, I have gone away. And then the comforter, which is universal Christhood, can come unto you. There's no extermination of civilization, is there? There's no civilization to exterminate. But these were words that were necessary in 1963. They're words that are also necessary in 1973 for most of the world. They're not necessary for you anymore. You don't need words anymore that give a sense of reality to this world because you have traveled a higher path than the path of those in the first and the second degree. You're at the point where, to you, the world never did exist because I have overcome the world. But this is not the I that must go away for the Comforter to come unto you. Those are the two natures of I. There is I, the world I, the mortal I, which must go away for the Comforter, which is the I, Christ, which has overcome the world. Now, if you have not overcome the world, Think for a moment. Where are you? Can you truthfully say that I have overcome the world? If you cannot, then you're not in the eye, are you? Because I have overcome the world. And if you cannot say, I have overcome the world, then you're not in that eye. Then where are you? You're divided. You're separated from I. You're separated from the Christ. You're not accepting yourself to be the Christ, and that is why you cannot say, I have overcome the world. But you must come to the place where I in you says, I have overcome the world. And that is why you must do this world work. To come to the place where the world has no fear for you, where there's no life in the world to die. When you have realized I, which has overcome the world, then you will realize you have no life that could ever die in the world, or be sick in the world, or be limited in the world. You recognize that when Jesus walks through walls or walks on water, this is the revelation of the nature of your being, that the I of you, the spirit of you, the self of you, is ever walking through the walls and windows of the world, even now. But how can you know this 
if you are still believing in the presence of a world. And so the world work which ostensibly begins to help the world is actually a deeper thing. It's to make us be lifted into the realization of the eye of our being which has overcome the world. For us now, we must live in the absolute realization that the world has already been overcome. It has no existence in I Christ. And because I Christ is your name, the world can have no existence in you. You are sowing completely to one infinite spirit without opposite. And so for others it's called world work and they may think they're improving the world. But at your level you should know the difference. We're living differently than anyone on this earth. Except those invisible selves who know the truth of oneself and those visible ones who from time to time retreat into the silence, sometime for long periods when they're never seen anywhere. They too are knowing the one invisible self which is the all, the I which has overcome the false concept called world. That's why we're not looking at our own daily harmonies. Joel says, is there a principle of life, a spiritual principle that will govern the world? And he says, there can be no question but that an individual can rise so high above the immediate circumstances on earth as to make himself immune to the disasters of this world. And so there are those on earth who today can walk immune, we in some measure, find that we're not subject to many of the things that other people are. Now he says that's not enough. Is that all that is concerning him? If it is, we may find that the world is a lonesome place to be in. This is the age in which everyone who is seriously on this path should forget his own problems. And mind you, he's saying that to his students, forget your problems. Something in us says, well, who's going to take care of me? Doesn't charity begin at home? Who's going to take care of me while I'm taking care of the world? And I want to make that very clear. You're not taking care of the world. You're accepting your infinite self. And that's who is taking care of me. You are. You're taking care of your infinite self, not your visible body. And all things are added unto you. You see the difference in the focus? Not only, says Joel, should we be ready to forget our own problems, but even be willing to lose our life, if need be in the search for and the demonstration of that principle which will mean life for this globe. And all of a sudden we are face to face with this. Again, when he says lose our life, he's talking about a life that has no existence, isn't it? That's why we can lose it. You cannot lose your divine life. You can lose your mortal sense of life, and that's what he means. Somewhere in here, it becomes clear that most of us in the world have rejected the supreme gift that we have been given. God has given us the supreme gift, which is himself. And unless you accept divinity, you reject the supreme gift of all and want to protect mortality, which only exists in the mind. And so you protect the illusion and reject the reality.
Perhaps 50 lessons ago, this might have been a difficult thing to accept. We've been through 66 weeks of the Gospel of John, and that followed on many other things. We are learning to impersonalize the world. There's no such thing as personalized evil, says Joel. If you've worked with the principles of the infinite way, you've already proved that the impersonalization of evil is three quarters of all that is necessary for healing. Three quarters. In other words, when there's no outer world in your consciousness, you're very close to that inner peace which is beyond human understanding but which is the dissolution of the illusion. Now, so far we've added something to this chapter that you haven't seen in the chapter. That is that there is no outer world. I do suspect that toward the end we have a quotation here that brings that in to focus, but it's much too important to just come to us at the end of a two-hour meeting. It's something we've got to learn to live with. And so I've been stressing it for that reason. Instead of impersonalizing evil and saying there's no person there, we're going that extra step and we're taking that person there and bringing them inside and saying they exist only in my mind. That is how you impersonalize them. You can't say they're not there with words. You've got to take them inside and see where they do exist. They exist only in your mind. You impersonalize them by knowing that they exist only within your mind. And I mean literally that no matter who you look at, they exist only within your mind. That is yourself, and you are not seeing yourself, you're seeing a person. That is God's self, and you're not seeing God, you're seeing a person. You cannot have a person and God too, because God is one and there is no other. There is no God and Every chapter in this book has brought us to the place where we can say there is no person there. There is no form there. There is no tree there. There is no valley there. That is all within my mind. And it's within the mind of everyone else who sees it. There is no evil on the earth because there is no person in whom evil can be. And that's the impersonalization of evil. There's no person there in whom the evil can be. And so we see there is no evil in a person because there's no person. And therefore, there is no evil person there. And there is no cause for evil because the only cause is God. You're taking the whole world and not bothering with the left side and the right side and the high and the low and the in-between, the whole world and putting it in your mind where it belongs and seeing that's the only place it is. And automatically you are impersonalizing and nothingizing when you do that without having to go through steps. Joel had a meditation in this chapter, which I think we can do now. His meditation says, and we'll do it with our eyes closed, but I'll have to read it to you because I like his words, the words of the Christ. Thou alone art power. Thou alone art presence. In thy presence is fullness of joy, fullness of life, here, there, everywhere. In thy presence there is only the spirit of God, the spirit of love,
spirit of truth, the spirit of life. And besides this, there is no other. So I am not going into meditation now to use God or direct God, but to realize God. Here where I am, God is. There where thou art, God is. And God is spirit and love. And beside him there is no other. As you dwell with the idea that here where you are is God, and there where someone else is is God, you have impersonalized. And you're down to that which is present here and there, which is God, which is I, the invisible Christ, appearing to human sense as person here and person there, where only the invisible self is. And as you rest in that, you're in oneness. You have realized the invisible one. And in the presence of the invisible one realized, you are free. You are free of every human need. The law is that spirit flows where spirit is recognized. You're in divine will. You are recognizing the invisible presence of divine will functioning itself. And it makes no difference what had appeared in the visible. It is known to be unreal, totally imaginary. The world has moved aside. And then divinity expressing through your transparent consciousness becomes a new visible world in which the added things are present. The goodness, the harmony, the love of the invisible makes itself manifest. You are one with the one. And yet you've asked for nothing. You have simply witnessed the inner truth. And that is how you bless the world. That is how your light is not hid. That is how you accept the supreme gift of God life as the only life of you and your neighbor. How different than all of this running around we do as human beings trying to fill all the gaps. is really believing in God. Mortal sense goes away <laughs> and we are Christ. We learn to accept Christ's identity, obey Christ's identity, serve Christ's identity, live in Christ's identity. We walk in Christ. And then every disturbance that arises is met the same way. Who are you? Who convinceth me of a disturbance? Where is it? It's in the mind. Be still in the mind. Know the truth. All that exists in the mind is not of the Father. The only truth is God presence here and now. And rest.
Now these are the weapons we have been given to accept divinity. We do not have to penetrate the Iron Curtain, says Joe. God has already penetrated it. But without our conscious realization of this truth, the presence of God will not function there any more than the presence of God has functioned there in the past. The presence of God functions only where and when there is conscious recognition and realization. That leads us squarely up to us. We must furnish that conscious recognition. We must abide daily in the invisible self. We must tuck the world in where it no longer exists as an external fact. Now, if we could accept the following statement, all of the world's troubles, as far as we are concerned, would be over. Page 202, there is no power in armies. You wonder what kind of a, an intelligence could make that statement. There is no power in armies. Could you tell that to Hungary or Czechoslovakia or Poland? There is no power in armies. And yet here it is statement of the Christ. Only the Christ could make the statement because only the Christ is power. And only the realization of the Christ reveals the non-power of the army. You might just as well have said no power in disease or sin or famine or poverty or death because they're all the same truth. The power of them exists only in the mind. That is not the Christ mind. The Christ mind in you, realized, reveals the non pilate that has no power over me. There's no power in death. You can't entomb me. There's no power in arthritis. Pick up thy bed and walk. What did hinder thee? What hindered you was the belief that there's power in the mind, that there's power in things and conditions and persons and material objects, but there aren't. There's only power in the Christ mind. In the absence of the Christ mind, all these false powers are rampant. There is no power in armies. I say unto you that this is a law and a principle. It operates in your personal life if and as you make a daily practice of realizing where I am, God is. God in the midst of me is mighty, and all those who are opposed to the purpose of God have but the arm of flesh and nothingness. The Lord God in the midst of me is mighty, and there is no might external to me. No might external to me. Not in the mind of man or in the matter of man. Which is another way of saying there's no world out there. That army which has power out there isn't out there. What human being can say that? None. There has to be a Christ standing there. And Christ isn't just going to stand there if you're not practicing Christhood. Why else would a statement like this, so contrary to all human understanding, appear? If it were not possible to attain that consciousness which could know that there's no power in our. No power in anything of the material world. No power in matter. No power in mind.
world work will open you to that realization. And only world work. When you work on individuals, persons, yourself, you don't open to this. Because you're always limiting and finitizing. That's how valuable world work is. It opens you to the place where you finally can see when they invaded that in that country, someone stands in world work. And someone in that country reaching out for God finds help unexpected. Our function is to be that consciousness which is available for someone to reach out and touch. Where I am, God is. That is the truth of all of us now. But keep this truth as a pearl of great price within you. Then abiding in this truth, praying the prayer of realization of God's grace, God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, and understanding the non-power of what is not ordained of God. You will be fulfilling your function in this world. And you will watch the breaking up of error all over the globe and the gradual restoration of harmony. I cannot accept that these words are spoken in vain. I can only accept that these words are spoken and that they will eventuate into exactly what they say. The breakup and the restoration of harmony, meaning the kingdom of heaven revealed. Not patching up a world, revealing the invisible kingdom of heaven, the change of consciousness, the change from mortal sense of life to the revelation of a spiritual universe as a living fact. But only by those who can sit and say where I am, fearing God is. And being willing to live with that conscious awareness as a universal fact. Where my neighbor is appearing, God is. Wherever anyone is appearing, God is. And that God everywhere is myself. For I am the father of that one self. That's what we've been trained for. That's what we've been chosen for. To let our light shine. But we must have some light to let shine. Divine light. Statements of truth will not save you. You must abide in truth. Dwell in it, live in it, hour by hour. Day by day, night by night. That means even while sleeping, we must know before we enter the sleep that consciousness is God and ever alive. It's the only way we can comply with a statement even night by night. We must know that Divine self, divine life is never asleep. All that goes to sleep is the sense form. And we must consciously know this. Until it is a very part of your being, and then all of a sudden, a spiritual light dawns within you, whereas I was blind, now I see. Now I know. That spirit is really the substance of all form, the law of all form, the cause of all form. My error had been that I had been believing in a power outside, a power in form, a power in thought, whereas all power is spiritual power. Once you get rid of that outside, then the inner 
and the outer are one and the same. No power in armies. Finally, he goes a step further. As you abide in this word, remember always, there is still one more step. That is that after contemplating the truth about God, and also about yourself, for they're one and the same, be still, listen, as if to say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Thou uttereth thy voice, and the earth melteth. In other words, always your contemplation of truth must be followed by the silence. Quite a number of people have failed to follow their contemplation with silence. And an equal number have failed to contemplate before entering the silence. So that they try to go directly to the silence sometime, and they find that it's a very shallow silence. They haven't plumbed the depths through recognizing truth consciously first. And if you will recognize truth consciously, accepting oneself without a world, and then dwell in the silence, the so-called powers of the world will subside. You see, we've been doing world work without really recognizing it. Whenever you enter truth, you're doing world work. You're leavening the consciousness of the world. But now we're doing it consciously. There's no reason to wait any longer. If there's a mudslide around anywhere in the world and you have allotted one meditation a day for the quiet realization of the non-world and therefore the non-power of the world, take it into consciousness, rest in it. You don't have to wait for the world to join you. There's always ten righteous invisible cells working. Join the ten. Make it your practice once a day. And this is Joel speaking, not me, although I'm not reading it. Make it your practice once a day to meditate on the nothingness of the world. Whenever you are faced with any form of condition in the world, that you recognize as being not of God. And then you're blessing your fellow man. You're recognizing his divinity. And you're blessing yourself. Joel suggests that we have one meditation daily on world work. Every day. And when you know that this is not just to protect the world or save the world, but rather to recognize your infinite self, I feel you're more apt to respond to that suggestion. I personally would feel that if a day went by that you were not doing this, that would be a day in which, for some reason or other, you are rejecting yourself. Too busy to find yourself. Now it comes. Error is not in the external. Power is not in the external. All power is in the still small voice. There's no power in sin. There's no power in disease. No power in tyrants. No power in external conditions. Power is in the still, small voice. He has told us there is no outside world. If it were there, it would have plenty of power.
Inasmuch as this is going to be the end of this book, here's Joel's final statement to us. In the midst of threatening world conditions, I say to you, think in higher terms than your own health, your own supply, or your own happiness. For some part of every day, give yourself to the realization and the practice of these principles through which you have witnessed healings of minor or major problems, principles that have helped you or your neighbor. Begin now to think in terms of a principle revealing itself on earth as the presence of God universally. That would be, of course, the realization of one. Divine self as the only self in the universe. Now you have a month in which nothing new will be coming from this pulpit. And so you can either Take it upon yourself to review the past, put into practice daily some of the things that have been suggested, and if you want to keep very current, to take today's lesson as your monthly work, every day for 30 days, one period of the day, to do world work, as follows. Face the situation that you have heard is impending or coming or present somewhere in the world. Face it with the knowledge that there is no world there. That there are no conditions, but there's no world to contain conditions. There are no evils, there are no fires, no floods, no epidemics. There is no problem out there. It's a world mirage. It's not ordained by God. It's not sustained by God. It has no law of God for its continuity. It wasn't caused by God. Take any phrases that you like until you can come to an instant agreement within yourself. That's true. What is out there the Spirit of God. What is here? The Spirit of God. Is there space between? No, it's all one indivisible Spirit. Myself is all that is out there. They're trying to sell me, tell me myself, my spiritual self, is not out there. And it is. And I'm not going to have to remove that condition. Or improve it. Or change it. Or correct it. All that is there is my divine self. God's divine self. The divine self of the universe is all that is there. And when you can find some inner peace from this, you'll know that your own consciousness of mortality has melted away. And even though the human mind doesn't understand a word of it, it makes no difference. When you find your inner peace this way, just be still. That is when the still small voice comes upon you. That is when realization comes upon you. That is when inner visions come upon you. That is when my peace comes upon you. And what happens in that inner realization becomes the law. And then something gives you the release and says it is done, or the sigh, or the rainbow, or something within that says my presence is now the only presence here. 
then you rest in that presence. And your world work is being done. You have overcome the world by finding the invisible presence. Russia won't declare peace and release the satellite nations, but you are helping invisible beings everywhere. You are leavening your own consciousness. You are letting your light shine. If the whole world could have been lifted up into paradise instantly, Christ would have done it in the form of Jesus. It's a slow leavening process, but it's our job. And it's a silent job. And it's the way to self-realization. Every day that you do this, you are accepting the infinity of your own being as the only reality. And as Joel says, until there is a dawning, Something happens to awaken you to the actual experience of self. Oneness realized manifests as the grace of God on earth. Now, as you do this during the month, when we meet again, you'll find that we're all at different levels than we are at this particular moment. That month of leavening will take us to a new precipice. We are opening ourselves to what may be called a special seven. They only function at the level of our own consciousness and as we are sowing to our one infinite self we are preparing the way for us to receive higher guidance than hitherto. So this month, I think, is a perfect time for this world work to be upon us. We should know each other better when we return. There's no other assignment for you during this month. must learn to recognize that the invisible will of the Father is ever working no matter what appearances seem to be there. And when you accept that invisible will as working now in the one self which is here without opposite and there without opposite it will manifest and you will have the God experience. This culminates 66 weeks of the Gospel of John. And our next series begins on the second Sunday in February. I think it's February 11th. It's called the Special Seven, and that culminates the work of Immortality House in San Francisco. In those seven, we will have much that is new and this month will make it possible thanks very much I hope to see you in February